Jody, thanks for joining us today in the Common Ground Alaska YouTube show. We're so glad to have you. I'm super stoked to be here. <laughs> thanks for having me. I'm really excited. Yeah. So for those of you who don't know, which would have to be few and far between, Jody, <laughs> Jody is uh, the director of the Matanuska Experiment Farm. And um, the, if you're not familiar with the Experiment Farm, you need to go check it out because it's super cool. So Jody, tell us all about you. Oh my gosh. Um, well, um, I, I am an administrator at the, uh, for UAF, um, and I have the best job in the world because I get to work for UAF, University of Alaska Fairbanks, but I don't have to live in Fairbanks, which is great. Oh, I never thought about that. Yeah, <laughs> Good it's point. super cool. Um, and so um, I, I am the director of the farm. Uh, I took that position in 2018, and... Um, it's, uh, that farm has so much potential. It's just, uh, and, and we're, we're moving forward building into that potential. So it's very exciting. It's a, um, it's a big, a big task, but I'm, I'm so thankful for the crew that I have to work with there. Um, super creative, imaginative, and, and all about supporting the community and developing all the things that are needed um, and doing it um, really professionally and doing it well. And so, um, and having a good time while we do it, which is really important. So we, we yeah, we do a lot of stuff. Um, it's located right behind the hospital here in, um, in Palmer. And um, we've been there. Um, the university has been there. The farm's been there since 1917. Oh, and, I didn't know that. Yeah, wow. yeah. Before statehood, before the university was a university. Wow. Um, yeah, and so we've been there quite a long time, um, and have changed a lot over those hundred plus years. Um, and we're moving into a new phase of of of, uh, of research, and just it's just super exciting. And so we also house the extension center. So the Matsu Copper River District is located at the farm as well. So we have extension going on. We've got 4-H. We've got classes, and now the pandemic is. <laughs> um, so our mask uh, mandates have been um, relaxed quite a bit through the university, and so we're now having in-person classes again, which is just like, oh, yeah. thank you. So yeah. exciting. That yeah. was a rough couple of years. <laughs> it was really rough, yeah. yeah. But we kind of dropped back and figured out we really needed to um, expand into the digital world, which we hadn't been pushed into and we needed to expand into. So we started doing... Doing um, um, through cooperative uh, through our cooperative extension program manager, um, she decided we need to have kind of themes each month so that we could have kind of something to base all of our conversations about, but also to kind of cross pollinate some of our viewers because we have people who have kids who are involved in 4-H, but they never knew that we taught canning classes, you know, or we have master gardeners, but they didn't know we did 4-H. And, you know, so what we wanted to do is we wanted to offer a theme each month that we could talk about in all of our aspects of extension and, and really reach as many people as possible and and even some of those you know very you know kind of single lane people involved in extension we wanted to get them involved in all the different things and so I think that we've done very well with that um the first year of the pandemic we had um in 2020 we taught 77 classes in the first six months Wow, that's All amazing. Online. Yeah, and we'd oh. not really offered online stuff before. So just the flexibility and the creativity of, of the team that we've got at the farm has just been amazing. And the willingness to jump in with both feet. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I mean, even our like our our grounds guys, our mechanic, our uh, they're, they've even done stuff with us. So it's just been a, a real team effort, which has been positive. I so, love yeah. that. That's yeah. so cool. Yeah. And it's neat because really, like you said, it it offers truly something for everyone. Yeah, is, exactly. That's neat. Yeah. So your specialty is soil. It and, is. And it soon is. to be Dr. Jody. Ha, ha, ha. <laughs> Someday. That's exciting. That's, I <laughs> just think it's awesome that you're following that dream. That's oh, really neat. Thanks. Yeah. 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 We'll we'll finish it up in a year or so, maybe. But um, yeah, I'll have a PhD in 
natural resource management, but specifically in soils. So that's yeah. pretty great. Yeah. So so tell me, I'm. I, they say Alaska soil is different, and um, I'm not a detail person. I'm not a scientist, so right. um, I'm just kind of a wing it and make it look whimsical and. Hope it doesn't die. <laughs> so, and you do an amazing job at like faking it, like you just said, which you're not. You, you so your stuff is so amazing. But well, yeah, if you call it whatever you want, but you're doing amazing stuff. Well, so. thank you. Yeah. We we enjoy what we do. <laughs> but I want to know. I specific like I want to just kind of dig into what makes Alaska soil different, and and um. And I hear over and over, you know, like on the Facebook groups and stuff, people say, I have the worst soil. I have the worst soil. I have the worst soil. So what does a person do? Like, yeah. um, that's kind of what I wanted to go over today is um, what makes our soil bad, which I'm sure you're going to say it's not bad. <laughs> so tell it's us not, about it's that. It's not bad. Exactly. So tell <laughs> us that. Um, and what can you do about it? That's okay. kind of the, the Those essentials. are like the big questions, right? I mean, right. those are huge. So, um really cool that, you know, starting out talking about what makes Alaska soils different, right? Mm -hmm. Um, Our soils are cooler. So cold soils is what makes everything, like that is the main thing. And then everything else is connected to, you can, you go back to because it's cold soil, right? And it's just like, because it's cold soil. (laughs) Um, So we'll just stick with the cold soil. Now, what we, um, you know, And so people may say, well, yeah, you know, I have family who live or I used to live in the lower 48 and I lived in North Dakota or lived in northern Wisconsin or northern Michigan and the soils are cold there. And and I won't disagree, Mm -hmm. but they're not as cold as our soils are. So we win. We win. (laughs) We have cold soils. Yay! (laughs) Um, So... In our area of the state, you know, in South Central Alaska, most of us aren't dealing with permafrost. And so we have slightly warmer soils kind of year round ish Mm -hmm. than, say, further north um, and then Fairbanks area and then further north of that, where permafrost becomes even more and more um, prevalent. And so that permafrost is, 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 basically permanently frozen soil that is directly below the active layer of soil. And that active layer is where all of the plants grow, Mm -hmm. grass, trees, everything. So, but even down here in South Central, um, after, I don't know, let's say a windstorm, because we never have those around here. But after a windstorm, if you look at all the trees that have been blown down, you'll see that even trees that should have really deep roots, mm-hmm. they're they're flat. Yep. And when they fall, they don't have a root ball. They have a root layer almost. Yeah. Yeah. And so it's because the, the those roots go till it's too cold, and then they're like, yeah, and then they just do that. <laughs> So even in even in our warmer soils down here, we have cold soils. Mm-hmm. So that that in terms of um, depth of root is going to affect our you know the the types of crops that we can grow um, and successfully grow um, trees you know, orchard trees, all the things, you know, we're dealing with those cold soils. But talking about soils at a nutrient level, the cold soils is still the culprit because cold soils mean that all of the microbes who are living in the soil who are responsible for the nutrient cycling, they're the ones who are doing the work. Um, because it's cold soil, their metabolisms are super slow. I mean, think about us in the winter, right? Like where we're just like, "Mm," and we just want (laughs) to sit and we don't, we're not, we don't want to be too active and we don't want to run around because like, why? Like, let's just, it's so nice to be like curled up and drinking tea and being warm. And that's what those bugs are doing in the soil. When I say bugs, I mean our microbes, right? Right, Bacteria and fungi. And so those guys are they're still active they're still breaking things down and cycling those nutrients that our plants eventually need but they're doing it really slowly interesting yeah and so even in our warm summer soils we still have cold soils and so 
We end up with nitrogen limited soils predominantly. Um, going back to cold soils, right? right? But also looking at like where our soils kind of are derived, like how they became soil. Um, here in the valley, in this part of the state, um, it's all wind blown. Most all of it is wind blown lus, so yep. silt from the glaciers. Sure. Um, and then we have shallow soils, so they're not super deep to begin with because we've had just wind deposit and it takes a long time for wind to make you know a six inch deposit of super fine silt that just happens to land because the wind stopped blowing and so so we have you know weird texture we have in this part of the state we have because we're on glacial moraines most of us have really fast draining soils so they're shallow and the water doesn't stick around, which also means it's really hard for water to be pulled up through it, like through roots and different things. So our water is really quite a limiting factor. Interesting. Yeah. And so, and and then, and then two, you know, Palmer, our average rainfall is like 13 inches a year. Right. And so most people who live here Mm -hmm. would say, oh, it's like, we get rain all the time. Right. Some summers. <laughs> yeah, and it feels like it, but we get like like heavy mist. We, yeah. we we get a dry rain. I used to like I laugh at because um it we're not getting like substantial rain. Mm-hmm. We're getting now the last few years we've had, you know, those kind of flood events where we've yeah. had those crazy rains and then people end up surfing in Palmer, right? On the street <laughs> exactly. because all the <laughs> everything's backed up. But and that's uncommon. That's very, very uncommon. So we're fairly dry naturally. Um, we have very well draining soils naturally. We have colder soils, so our nutrient cycling is a much slower process. Okay. So when you add lime to your soil to take that pH that low pH and bring it up to helpful uh, to 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 be more helpful to bring um, all of those plant available nutrients kind of up and in line and available to plants. Um, it takes longer for that to break down in the soil because cold soil. So sure. everything goes back to cold soil. So what? Yeah, there are cold soils in the lower forty eight. But basically, they're warmer cold soils than our cold soils are. That makes sense. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So that brings me to a question. We'll talk about how to fix it in a minute. Yeah. But I want to ask, I'm super um, interested in and am going to try to prove people wrong about hugel culture because I think it's such a cool idea. My my thought is, you know, people start with like big logs. Yes. And, and my thought is, well, maybe if we start with something smaller and just... But you're saying because of the cold soil and, and everything, it's still going to take it'll take longer. Longer, to yeah. Break. But it, it could be good. It's it's good for forward thinking, but not necessarily. I can't build a hugel culture bed and plant in it this year necessarily. Um, and not reap the benefits that right. someone outside would probably get. Yeah, okay. but I mean, people are doing hugel culture up here. I mean, I know that Deb Blaylock has a beautiful hugel culture. Really? Oh, Ooh, yeah. I'd love to it's see awesome. it. It's awesome. Yeah, and um, and several people are doing it. Okay. Um, and you know, I mean, um, you know. I, Decomposition is happening in our soils. And, I mean, you know, my backyard's um, huge sinkhole is proof of that um, because when, you know, oftentimes uh, contractors will take all the scrap wood from a lot and bury it. And then just cover it, you know, just cover it. But they don't bury it well. They don't tamp it in, and they don't fill in those gaps. And so what happens is over time, you get this sinkhole, and then I have to, I don't know, hire some dirt guy to come in and drop a bunch of dirt in my backyard. Or you have an automatic Google culture right there. Just dig it out. Exactly. (laughs) But it's so deep. It would cost so much to dig it out. So instead, I hire your son to fill it in for me. And it worked really great. It's beautiful. But that's, I mean, it's happening, right? And it's happening... Um, but again, those are really deep. So uh, that's a really deep hole. Yeah. And so Shoot. keeping your hugel culture, not doing like the giant logs, like mm-hmm. a lot of people are doing, but like you said, keeping the, the, the carbon bits, the big chunky carbon, the woody bits 
a little bit smaller than, say, like timbers that mm-hmm. a lot of people start with and yeah. then build up on that. Um, but you're gonna you're gonna end up over time. It'll break down. It's it's just a natural process. It sure. just won't be as fast as below. Okay. So yeah, go for it. Which that could you could use that to an advantage yes. too because you've got your bed. Yep. You know. Yep. For a, it's sustaining for a lot longer. Exactly. And so it's going to be, but because it's a slow breakdown process, you're going to get a slow nutrient cycling as well. You're not going to get that kind of big bang for your buck. It's going to be a slower release and less over time. So you're not going to, you're going to want to probably add some nitrogen into your beds as okay. they break down. And that's going to help speed up the breakdown a little bit, but okay. it's also going to give those plants an opportunity to, to thrive. That makes sense. Yeah. Okay. So um, let's go back to soil. How do we fix our, you've said what our problem is. Now, what do we do about it? And I mean, yes, we can add fertilizers, but, sure. um, which is one option. Yeah, Absolutely. Um, well, I mean, if our biggest problem is cold soil, mm-hmm. right, our fix would be to warm it. Yes. So how do we do that and and do it um, sustainably and intelligently and not expensively, right? Yes, like all exactly. those things. So it's as simple as a raised bed. Okay. That Even just that is enough of a heat increase that you're actually going to get more response from it. Okay. So raised beds, and it doesn't have to be this high. It can be even just um, a soil raised bed where you take your row and you build like a trapezoid Mm -hmm. and it's flat on top. Even that is going to give you those four to six inches, however big your bed is, that lifted, that raised bed is actually warmer than that soil right here. Okay. And so the, but will the bugs still have a slow metabolism? <laughs> oh, the, it'll For warm up. I mean, they're warm. So, so they'll so be, they'll... it'll be faster in there okay. and the nutrient cycling will be a little bit better, a little bit okay. faster than even just right here. Perfect. Um, so yeah, warming our soil is the first thing. And then people get really creative with soil warming as well. Okay. Um, high tunnels certainly work. Low tunnels, which are just like a high tunnel, but shorter. <laughs> Sorry. <There's laughs> that. That. Um, using um, different materials to cover the ground to warm up mm-hmm. the soil. Um, so when you start partnering those things together, right? So you have a raised bed with a covering over it mm-hmm. and put a low tunnel over yes. the top of that, yep. you've created a really nice and warm little place for a lot of the, a lot of your garden plants that need maybe warmer feet than mm-hmm. potatoes and cauliflower and that sort of thing, yeah. right? Yeah. So like green beans, mm-hmm. right? Or any of your melons or anything like that. That's corn also. Yes. Um, those all need that extra heat extra 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 heat um and so now you've got more microbial activity because you've warmed the soil and you're able to increase your soil temperature so now you can plant plants in that soil that need warmer germination temperatures oh right okay right so a lot of people are like but i just like to grow in the ground which is fine but if your soil never reaches above 45 degrees then all of those plants that you want to grow that require 60 degree, you know, temperatures mm-hmm. for germination, ooh, that's questionable. Yeah. Right? So you can manipulate all of those things. Which is probably where the, the myth came that you can't grow certain things. Yes. And why innovation is helping this happen. Exactly. So a couple of examples we have in our greenhouse, we grow cantaloupe commercially. I know. And, and it's <laughs> magical. People are, their minds are blown. I've heard people from Fairbanks are like, Hey, isn't there somewhere down there growing cantaloupe? I'm like, yes, there is. And I know it. <laughs> it's good stuff. No um, doubt. We get a little spoiled. We just run out and grab one for breakfast. Right. Oh my gosh. <laughs> but, um, so we have the, the black, Jean could tell you what it's called, but the black IRT. stuff. IRT. Um, uh-huh. Yeah, on yep. the ground. Yep. And then, it's, but it's in also our yes. high tunnel, I guess it would be called. So those two things are working together to warm the soil and make it an environment that exactly. would be good for them. Yeah. yeah that, so 
And for some reason they like it. So I appreciate and that. And that works. <laughs> yeah, it's perfect. Yeah. yeah, exactly. And so, so in a warmer soil and then you add, let's say, compost to it, mm-hmm. that compost is going to break down faster in those warmer soils sure. than it will in your on-ground garden or soil beds. Right. So I never thought about I'm kind of riffing for a second, but... Um, so if a person wanted their compost, because we have a chicken coop and all that, and but my compost, it doesn't matter how much I turn it. The thing, it, I get it steamy. I get so excited. I'm like, yes, it's steaming. <laughs> <laughs> and then we get a cold snap. But um, so if that was inside some sort of building or undercover... I mean, probably people already know this, but... Well, no, uh, and compost is going to be different. Um, the heat of a compost pile is driven by the microbial activity. Okay. And it really, you know, I, I people are like, Jody, I got a tumbler. It's black. It's going to absorb sunlight. And I'm like, it doesn't matter. Like, yeah. that really doesn't matter. What matters is, and in the sense of um, you want to keep everything thawed, Right. So if it freezes, then yeah, that's a problem. So you would want to keep it warmer um, so it doesn't freeze. But in the summertime, then it's more a matter of the balance of your carbon and nitrogen ratios that are keeping your pile like super hot and working. Okay. So sometimes it's just that it's it's off balance because you really need Closer to like three parts carbon and one part nitrogen. Okay, so what provides carbon and what provides nitrogen? In your chicken example, uh-huh. all of the bedding straw is going to be the carbon. Okay. And the poo is the nitrogen. Oh, nice. Yeah. And so if you're, um, I would probably guess that it's closer to maybe two to one. Okay. Poo to carbon. So I would add more carbon to your pile. Oh, okay. Yeah. Which we do. All of our, yeah. we don't waste a kitchen scrap. Everything oh, Everything exactly. goes in the compost. And and then, and then by, um, and then all your kitchen scraps are nitrogen, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. So something that usually, that oftentimes happens is people um, habitually, you know, will gather kitchen scraps and then drop it in the pile once a week or every other day or however often. Well, you're starting your pile from scratch every time you do that. Right. Yeah. So you need to start. I know. So we it's, talked about this. We need two. We need like yes. our pile that's that's working. Yep. And then be a adding. collection pile. Yeah. 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 That's that would. It's be. hard to do. It's hard to do. It is. But once you're set up, I mean, it costs nothing. I you know. can do it for mm-hmm. a zero. Yeah. And then you're not buying the chemicals, which there's a time and a place for those too. Right. But. Exactly. Yeah. And so, yeah. And so oftentimes what happens is, is that we, we have a really good working compost pile. We turn it, we need to water it a lot. Oh, okay. Yeah. So piles dry out super fast, especially in the core, because that's where all the activity is. So all that moisture is evaporating out. Interesting. Yeah. Okay. Good to know. See? All right. <laughs> well, and the other thing that you talked about with soil that I thought was interesting, we can have a good rain, and it'll feel like, oh, this is this is really good. And Gina will go out to the orchard, and you scrape the dirt away, yes. and it's totally dry. Yes. Just barely. Yeah. How Then how do you um, combat that? Right. It's, you really, you have to water way more than you think you do, yeah. right? Yeah. Um, and so... Um, this is why farmers who irrigate, um, especially in Palmer, there aren't very many who do, but you'll drive by their farm and it'll be raining and the, they're irrigating. And yeah. you're just like, what crazy mess is going on over there? Right. Uh, don't they know? You know, is it so <laughs> automatic that it doesn't stop when it's raining? Right. And it's because it, it, it doesn't matter. That rain won't penetrate the soil to the depth of the roots. So you play in your garden. So everybody has a different soil texture. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's different in every every garden. Sure. Even your neighbors are going to have different issues than you've got. Mm-hmm. So what you do is is that you figure out how long, how much water does it take, you know, for me to water in that soil mm-hmm. so that it gets to root depth and sure. or at least penetrates the surface. Because like you said, and, mm-hmm. you know, um, Randy is – really bad at watering the garden because he's like spray 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 
It looks wet. <laughs> Spray. Yep. Everything's wet and dripping. I'm done. And I'm like, yeah. no. And, and you go out and it doesn't even, you don't even have to swipe like this. It's, it's just crazy. that much. Yeah. yeah. And it, there's no penetration into the soil. So, you know, increasing, slightly increasing some organic material in your soil is going to create little sponges throughout your soil, um, which is going to be helpful it's going to help pull that water in a little bit. Um, if it's not draining super well, adding sand to your soil, okay. um, especially if you water it and it just sits on the surface, your your silts are creating basically a block. So get some sand, mix it in. Um, and then just trial and error to figure out how long do I have to have the sprinkler on? Yeah. Right. Um, to penetrate, you know, I mean, cause even if it penetrates, you know, an inch, your roots, you know, are not an inch down. No. Right? Yeah. 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 They need a lot more than that. Right. So Jean has, we use, um, we have a drip system. Nice. So, and sometimes he'll say it has to go for three hours or five hours. And I just think, man, that just seems like, you know, the pump's constantly going <laughs> off and on. I'm like, Oh, so but, much money. Yeah, I know, but it's, it's what you have to do. Yeah. And, and, um, yeah, so that's interesting. Yeah. The other thing I noticed that I thought was, I just thought was neat was um, every year, because we are we sell commercially, so we like to keep the farm looking nice, but we don't use chemicals, so, you know, and we don't have time to weed three acres. <laughs> so, Jeez, what? So we put down the fabric, the landscape yep. fabric around the trees, and but it's a slow, pro- it's expensive, so we, you can't, we couldn't do the whole farm all at sure. once. So we had planted a honeyberry um patch and we put half of it the year we planted it we did have about three quarters of it with the the landscape fabric and then the other part of it wasn't and by the end of summer the difference in the plants and it wasn't i gene pointed out he said he thinks it's heated the soil yeah one and moisture it's keeping the moisture in also and the nutrients and stuff it just i thought it was really it was amazing i took a picture because i i couldn't believe the difference between just And that's all the, everything is done exactly the same except for that landscape. Well, and then think too about the other patch that has the weeds in between, right? They're taking nutrients away from your honeyberries. And in this patch, there was no competition for nutrients. True. So these guys were just like, woohoo. Like they were, (laughs) they were just like buffet. (laughs) And these guys over here are like, oh my gosh, I hope I find food today. And so, yeah, yeah, that competition is, is, is actually pretty substantial as well. Yeah. Because weeds are, excellent at stealing any Ugh. nutrients they can find that's they've evolved to be amazing at that yeah, yeah and so that's why they're everywhere and that's why there's certain ones in certain conditions and so when you get your soil up to you know being a healthy soil a really strong soil that has all of the right kind of um natural balance to it mm-hmm. then those weeds don't they're just like, oh, this is too good for me. Like, it, it really becomes a fact. Like, I'm out. Cause you mean there's a cure for chickweed? Theoretically, yeah. <laughs> I haven't seen it, but yes, according to soil health, yes, That's it is. That's a billion dollar idea right Wouldn't there. it be amazing? Oh, my gosh. Oh, jeez. <laughs> We're trying to embrace chickweed. They say make pesto. I'm like, oh, I just don't want to. Just go <laughs> so away. So much pesto. <laughs> I know. The world doesn't need that much Nobody pesto. Nobody needs that much pesto. <laughs> Oh, that's awesome. Okay. Well, I think we've covered most of it. What else do you have to say about soil health or what should, so if I'm starting gardening this year, starting a brand new garden and this is a big deal and I've been there and I failed. (laughs) But you didn't because you learn and you moved on. You do. You learn and you move on. But what, if you were to give someone just a couple tips just to get started, what would you say to increase their chances of success? Oh, that's a really good question. Um, I would say if money is no object, (laughs) you can do anything with money is no object, but I mean, within limits, right. Um, I would get soil sample and send it and get it tested. Okay. So let me caveat. Yeah, please do. So you can get the little $15 soil sample kits at mm. at Home Depot. Well, I will tell we got those, we've used them and, and they are, I think they have a, a place like when he's checking his pH and stuff, they, they're decent, but we did send in for a professional soil sample, which it wasn't expensive. I can't remember how much it was. It's it was less than $20. Yeah. It yeah. wasn't a lot. Yeah. Um, but it comes back with a pretty detailed. Yes. And, and that's where we can help. Oh, so they can come to you. Yeah. Oh, 
Oh, there you go. problem solved. There it is. <laughs> they can go bucks. to any soil water conservation district office. Okay. They can go to cooperative extension office. Okay. Um, they could also talk to um, NRCS um, agronomist. Okay. The statewide agronomist, which we have a new one. He's moving up next week so oh, he'll be here soon that's exciting which is really cool so we have a new state agronomist which okay. is really cool um and and yeah so we can help analyze like the test like what does it all mean um and there's also um through the kenai cooperative extension office they have a and it's available online and you have to google it I don't re- I don't really remember the names of it, but it's basically a calculator for you oh. to. It's like an Excel spreadsheet, and it's a calculator where you put in all of your results from your soil test, and then at the bottom it gives you like you need this much that. Okay, so it's helpful. Nice. But if you do want like an analysis and to talk to a human, then we can do that for you. Wow, because sometimes. Yeah. Sometimes when you get your your everything else, then you have more questions. <laughs> yeah, well, and that's true, and that and and there's so much on those that I don't even care about as a yeah. soil scientist. I'm like, and we don't worry about these. That's things, good to right? know. Interesting. Yeah, um, but it's a really good bang for your buck financially, and okay. so it costs. Um, there are several different. Um, all of the labs are outside. We don't have a lab in the state of Alaska, um, and. Um, the cooperative extension office has a publication that talks about the th- three different labs that you can send okay. stuff to. Um, we'll just put links to all this in the show notes. Yeah, cool. So and so, yeah, so easy. check that out and um, follow those directions. And I would, I would do a, a composite sample, right? Okay. So what that means is, so keeping in mind that this is like an x-ray, if okay. you will, right? So it's just, it's really a photograph of a very specific place and time and what's happening in your soil right then at that moment, okay. right? So if it if it just rained and it's mm-hmm. super, super wet, or if, you know, if, 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 all the ifs, sure. what you don't want to do is if you have a patch the size of, like, say, this table, you don't want to just, like, take one sample and send it away. Okay. Because that just told you what's happening in that one spot. It sure. doesn't help you get an idea or a picture of this. So what you do instead is what's called a composite. Mm-hmm. Is you try to look at your space and then break it into smaller units and you know in a space this big I'd probably go with maybe 5. Okay. And so take 5 6 inch deep samples. Mm-hmm. Put them in a bucket, just a little core. You don't need eight gallons of soil for each one. (laughs) Don't waste that much. But you can do that and then put them in a bucket and shake the bucket really, really strong. Okay. And then put like a cup. You don't actually, most places need like a quarter of a cup. But a cup of that mixed up soil, mix it really, really good. Get in there, break up everything. Do this. Get rid of the grass and the bits. Sure. um, And try to get it just straight up soil. But put that cup in a Ziploc bag, send it away. Um, most of the labs, you don't have to dry it ahead of time. You can just send a wet sample nice. and you'll get a response within the week. Yeah. Which is amazing. They and emailed very fast. our response, yes. which I thought was nice. They, yes. Um, and then I could just print it out. Yep. And, um, so I should have brought ours for you to look at. See, I could do that. <laughs> and then, and then if you're not into that and you don't yeah. have the time or you don't want to spend it, most everybody has it, there there are some spots in Alaska where we don't have acidic soils but most of the people in, especially in south central are going to be on acidic soils okay so if you're not going to get you're not going to send away your soil for a, a, an analysis um and you're you know you're into just like i don't know let's try this um lime it oh okay add Add lime to your soil. Okay, so I'm going to speak, I'm going to advocate for people who are literally starting out because this was me at one point. Jean said, I need you to go get me some lime. So I went to Home Depot. And do you know how many times, there's dolomite lime and there's this lime and there's that lime and there's ag lime and there's all the limes. Yes. So how do we know what lime to buy? Even that's a daunting question. Good question. If you go to a box store and you say, I need lime and they send you to the concrete section, 
walk away <laughs> and go to the garden section and ask for lime out there because okay. there's all there's concrete lime okay which will kill everything oh gosh okay yeah. good to know <laughs> and so you never want that so okay. always go for the garden lime okay yep uh dolomitic lime is just lime car- calcium carbonate with magnesium so oh. you get magnesium and calcium Some added nutrients yep it's like a multivitamin it kind of like a multivitamin <laughs> yeah okay. it works really well um the the big thing is it, more important like all limes will do the same job okay okay so it that doesn't matter what matters is the surface area so okay. are you getting chunks of rock are you getting little pellets of rock? Okay. Are you getting powder rock? Okay. Those are the things that you really need to look at and think about. Because think about a rock breaking down in your soil versus little pellets versus a powder. Oh, okay. Right? Okay. Mm-hmm. Because the greater the surface area, the faster it'll break down. Sure. So powder breaks down the fastest. Okay. It's the most pain to uh, to apply. <laughs> Find a not windy day. I was going to say, not on a windy day. (laughs) (laughs) And it's just, it's super fine powder. So it just goes everywhere. And it's not something that you really want in your mouth. And it ends up there. In your nose and everywhere. (laughs) So think about your application, right? And, you know, obviously you don't want the giant rocks. Mm -hmm. But do you want the super pellets that are, you know, big pellets or little pellets or, you know, those sort of things versus powdered? Okay. That's really the big thing to deal with. And and what you add this year to your bed, you're going to reap the benefits starting next year. Next year. Yes. Right. That's a big thing, too. It is a big thing. Because, like, everyone assumes, like, I put the lime, and now my pH has immediately right. come up. And it Not doesn't so. work that way. No. Yeah. It's a slow, again, back to the cold soils, yeah. right? It's a slow process. It's a okay. slow process in warm soils. Sure. Okay. So it's a slower process in colder soils. Okay. Yeah. So brand new gardener, get a soil test if that doesn't overwhelm you. Yep. Or if you don't want to do that, then at least apply some lime. Right. Because you're going to have to apply lime anyway. Sure. <laughs> Once you get your your test right. back, right. the first thing you'll need to do is add lime anyway. So. Okay. But... Adding lime brings your pH up, and that's the biggest bang for your buck because okay. when pH is as low as it is in natural conditions, mm-hmm. a lot of times between like four and a half to five and a half, okay. your plants and the plant available nutrients are most available in like the six. Point two to seven range. So they're just not getting the nutrients that they need. And the nutrients are in the soil. Right. They're there, right. but, they're, but they can't extract them. Exactly. Because they're okay. locked up. So by getting that pH up, you can actually increase the nutrients to your plants without adding nutrients to your soil. Okay. Very good. So yeah. so I'm going to take it one, dig it one step deeper then. Yep. So I, I apply lime this year, but it's not going to help me this year, but I want to have a garden this That's year. Is right. there something I can do to Heck yeah. help the Help the lime this year? Um, well, just grow plants that aren't pH sensitive. Oh, so just okay. grow things that are going to be successful. Okay. So um, stick to crucifers, right? Okay. So all of your cabbages and um, broccolis and cauliflowers. Um, Brussels sprouts are kind of... Mm, they're they're a hit and miss, even for really good gar- gardeners. They sometimes, they are. And but I've so, never seen anything cute. I had no oh, idea how a Brussels so, sprout, sprout grew till last year. They're so cute. They're and adorable. <laughs> I know, and they're so good. They're they, so good. Oh fresh. my goodness, they're just incredible. Fresh. I, I mean, who yeah. would have thought? Uh, they're mm-hmm. amazing. And potatoes. I mean, you know, grow things that grow well up here. Sure. Um, especially for the first couple of years, because nothing is more disheartening than starting a garden and having no success. Yeah. So, yes, you can do things to the soil to help improve that opportunity for success, but you can also be smart and plant the right things. Like yeah. potatoes are stupid. Yeah. <laughs> so just put them in the like ground. Potatoes, they're fine. They're just so happy. They're they like, are. Whatever. They're like, whatever. <laughs> we'll and feed you, you know, all year. Yeah. And it's just like, oh, you didn't feed me all summer. I'll still give you a few potatoes. I won't give you as many as if you'd have fed me well, yeah. but I'll still help out. So it's true. Yeah. So just plant smartly and yeah. and then start experimenting, right? Mm-hmm. Um you know, peas are going to be just awesome, um, and they grow so well up here. And 
take that pea plant when it's fall time and mix it into your soil. Oh, great. Right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. So it's called green manuring, but mm-hmm. you're turning all of the nutrients that are above the ground, mm-hmm. minus the ones you just ate, um, <laughs> which are delicious and sweet and yummy. But then you're turning all the other stuff back into the soil. Okay. And so that's where a lot of people make huge mistakes in that kind of that that cycling process because they're removing everything off the surface and dumping it into their compost pile, which is like, it's okay, but you can actually turn it right into your, to your soil. Nice. And it'll, it'll break down. Mm -hmm. Right. And it adds a lot of nitrogen and it makes the bugs really, really happy. Okay. Well, good to know. I love that. But this time of year right now, everyone's antsy. Yes. So my suggestion is coffee grounds right Ooh, now. Okay, let's talk about coffee grounds. Because what you do is if, if you know where your garden bed is on that big patch of really heavy white snow that we've got everywhere. Yes, so much snow so right much now. So snow. Oh, my word. Start taking coffee grounds out okay. and sprinkling them over your garden patch. Where your garden's going to go, okay. Yeah. And what happens is, is that the suns come back. Happy spring, by the way. Yes. Today is the, uh, oh, tomorrow's the day. Tomorrow's yeah. the first day of spring. Yeah, it is. Ooh, Today yay. is the equinox. All right. Um, and so um, what's happening when the sun comes back for us Alaskans, it means that we have heat. The sun has heat again, yep. right? Yep. Um, and so those little black coffee grounds absorb heat. Okay. So they actually create like a melt. Interesting. And... They give nitrogen to the soil. So it's what? like a double bang for your buck. Just for your old coffee grounds. Old coffee grounds. Away. Yep. What? Okay, so can you put too many coffee grounds anywhere? Nope. No, no way too many. Mm-mm. So just start spreading them all around. Yep. My friend in Galena does this. And oh it's hilarious to see in a week's time, what? he's got like his whole section. I mean, in feet of snow depth. Wow. And he'll have whole sections that are like, it looks like he shoveled them out. Oh, for heaven's sake. Yes. Oh, man. I'm going to go clean out the coffee pot. When we get and home. the cool thing is coffee grounds are everywhere. I mean, we have yep. coffee shops on every corner. Right. And oftentimes you can just ask them, like, if you know someone who works at a shop, like, hey, can you guys collect some coffee grounds for me? And give them a five-gallon bucket with a lid. Wow. Put your name and number on it. Yep. Just drop it off and then ask them, like, when this is full. And they can throw in the the filters as well oh okay it's fine though most coffee shops are doing like the press and so there's no filter but right, still right. um at schools hospitals anywhere where there's lots of coffee drinkers wow. you can collect coffee grounds in a five gallon bucket and then when it's full you just take them out and you just start throwing them around put it in your flower beds like every spring it's a really great way to kind of wake your soil microbes up Incredible. with some food and it's not going to hurt anybody wow boom this that makes the whole podcast right, right? There. how cool is that <laughs> i love it okay all right well this has been a great talk oh thanks i want to know um just real quick what if we were if we were to go we have a visitor <laughs> If which if we were to go to um, the experiment farm, like what 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 are you offering? Like I just I'm I wasn't able to make the class, but I signed up for it for a um, creative ways to do your garden or whatever it is. Um, so I'm looking forward to watching that one. But, oh yeah, but tell me what what kind of classes you have coming up? Oh gee, um, well let's see. This month, so March is almost over, but March is Sustainable Living Month. So we had all of our courses were like focused on sustainable living all the way from I taught a class on just um, gardening across Alaska and just all sorts of like goofy like you can do it like it doesn't matter. And um, that was at the beginning of the month. And we've had, um, you know, using the right using foods and sustainable living in terms of like energy efficiency and all that sort of stuff next month because it's Earth Day. 
okay. in April. So that's our focus. So again, a lot of like recycling, reusing, renewable type work. Okay. Um, and so not knowing exactly what classes we're offering, sure. but I know that we'll have those, but there's still, you know, half a month of March or less, less than half a month, but <laughs> it's almost there's, done. There's, there's still that, but um, our Facebook page has all of our calendars, okay. and so you can see those. Um, and hopefully we'll start doing some face-to-face classes as well. Oh, that would be great. So exciting. So do you still have your garden plots? Yes, we still have community garden okay, plots. Okay, let's talk about yeah. that super quick and to yeah. wrap up. Um, so Teresa Isaac is our admin, and okay. so she has – kind of taken over the community gardens which is amazing and so she not only not only do we have our community garden plots eight by 20 plots um we also have 18 by 18 plots which are big and so that's like we've had people who can't they don't want to waste their garden space at home on potatoes sure so they plant an entire 18 by 18 bed with potatoes wow yeah so they have potatoes for days which is great that's what they (laughs) needed but um and so we've got those things happening Mm -hmm. and then Teresa's also running the garden to heal project where we're bringing in um she has collaborated and and worked with um different um social organizations around the valley and agencies and Um, we give them an 18 by 18 plot and then they bring their participants, clients and learn to garden, learn to grow and heal through gardening. Wow. It's such a cool thing. I'm super proud of Teresa for that. Yeah. So she's really worked hard on that. And so, um, our Facebook page should have information soon about our garden plots. There, um, we offer tools, and this year, hopefully, if the you know virus stays down, we'll be able to offer tools for sharing. Oh, and good. also, there's always water on site. There's water available. Um, and we'll also have a planting day, I'm hoping, uh, a couple different planting days. So if a participant plays and comes during planting day and, and is part of it, then their, their cost is cut in half for nice. their rental. Okay. Um, and we've been charging half because, uh, our last two years because of the pandemic and um, we haven't been able to offer the face-to-face, you know, planting day sure, kind of sure. festivities. But we'll have two planting days. One will be an evening kind of after work time, and one will be like a weekend. And this is for afternoon. planting on the farm, not yep. for their own plot. This is for... Oh, no, this is for planting for their on their own, own plot. plot. Yeah. Oh, yeah. okay. So Very good. We, we, we're there, and then we offer expertise and just get to nice. know people and hope that they get to know their neighbors. And yeah. it's just a, it's a community building opportunity. Brings the community yeah. in. That makes yeah. sense. Perfect. Yeah. I love that. Yeah. Jody, thank you so much oh, for coming. Thank you it's, so much, Danny. You're this always is a fun. wealth of information. <laughs> I appreciate it so much. Thanks. It's been a blast. Thank you. All right. All yeah. right.